Hi, and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. It's Science Fiction Saturday again, so I am doing two amicus science fiction movies from the 1960s. And don't ask me about the Dalek movies. I've already done them. They're both pretty bad. I'll be honest with you right up front. These movies are pretty bad, but they're watchably bad. So let's get started with 1967's The Pteranauts, based on Murray Leinster's novel The Wailing Asteroid and with a script by John Brunner which is kind of interesting because this may be the worst movie to have a script written by a Hugo Award-winning writer. Brunner's novel, which is brilliant, uh, Stand on Zanzibar, won the Hugo Award in 1969, two years after this movie was made. So that's a big career arc. And to be honest with you, the script's not bad. The script itself has written on the page, and if you just focus on the movie based on the script, not entirely bad. It starts with a UK... Uh, radio telescope site with a project called Project Star Talk, which is a fairly prosaic name for something that's essentially the SETI program 10 years before the SETI program got off the ground. And a group of scientists, Joe Burke, played by Simon Oates, his mate Ben, played by Stanley Meadows, and Sandy Lund, played by Zena Marshall, uh, have been working for four years to listen out for radio signals from extraterrestrials. Perfectly valid thing to do. And the problem is that the chief scientist of the radio telescope, a guy called Dr. Shaw, played by Max Adrian, who seems to think that he's in a stage play rather than in a movie, because he plays things very loud, with very careful enunciation, and seems to be not on the same page as the rest of the actors. But we released the telescope on time, if that's what you want to know. I'm glad to hear it. Expensive equipment can't be allowed to waste its time on unscientific theorizing. It has real work to do. By the way, Max Adrian was fantastic in a movie called Port of London from 1948, playing an acrobatic thief. But this is 20 years later, and uh, he does seem to have spent a lot of his time on stage, and that is being reflected in the quality of his movie performance. So the movie starts out with basically Dr. Shaw telling off the other scientists, the, the people in Project Star Talk, and saying, you haven't had any success in four years, so I went to your funding organisation and told them you weren't doing the job. But that's so many red flags that in a modern work environment, he'd be the one out on his ass and not the others. So they've got three months to prove that they can get an extraterrestrial signal before their funding goes and they lose their shared time on the radio telescope. Now, even though he doesn't know it, Dr. Burke has previous history with extraterrestrials. When he was a boy, his uncle in a French archaeological site found a strange box that shouldn't have been where it is. And the boy accidentally breaks the box and inside it are a whole bunch of crystals. The little boy has one of them in his hand when he falls asleep. And he dreams of a planet with two suns. This is part of the ID fix that Joe Burke has to find extraterrestrial intelligence through radio communication. Fortunately, just as things are coming to an end on their project, find a signal. It's repeating itself, it's patterned, and it's coming from somewhere in deep space. So they spend the last of their funding money to basically reply with the same signal. On the day that they do that, there are a couple of extra people in the building where Project Startalk is. There's a tea lady played by Patricia Hayes. There's a broadly played Cockney tea lady. Well, what are you all getting up to tonight, then? We're trying to contact someone in space. No. When's this supposed to be happening, eh? Any minute now. And there's an accountant who has been sent by the funding organisation to go over the books of Project Star Talk. And he is played by Charles Hawtrey from the Carry On movies. My name is Joshua Yellowlees of the Holmes Foundation. I have been instructed to familiarise myself with the detailed accounts of this undertaking. Why? Expenditure has increased so enormously over the past few weeks. Mr Holmes wishes to know why. Shall we look at the books? Now, Charlie Vautry was an interesting guy. Very camp, very out as far as his sexuality was concerned, even though it was a very dangerous thing to be out in England in the 1960s before the legalisation of homosexuality. He actually moved to the town of Deal on the coast so that he could be closer to sailors. And he actually was quite successful romantically with his trysts with sailors who were training at the local Navy base. Leaving that aside, he's in there as, as comic relief as indeed is a Patricia Hayes character. And they're basically their function in the movie is to ask questions. And the questions they're asking are kind of important. 
should we be sending out signals to deep space in case the aliens are hostile? And things like that. And they're quite valid questions. Of course, the answer to that one is we've been doing that for 100 years already by using radio. And so that cat's out of the bag. And if aliens are going to zoom in on the Earth, all they have to do is come within about five light years of the planet. And they will see that we're blasting out as much radio signal as a small neutron star. It takes 18 minutes for the signal to get from the source to the Earth and from the Earth to the source. When that happens, a spaceship comes down to Earth and grabs the whole building where Project Star Talk is and takes it off in space. This distresses the tea lady, this distresses the accountant, and it distresses the three scientists. They work out that it's a pretty advanced race because they still have gravity, they still have oxygen, they're not being roasted by solar radiation, things like that. The spaceship takes them to a base where a really funky looking robot puts them through a bunch of intelligence tests which are quite well done. And there's some really nice set design on the alien base as well. Things aren't quite human-like on the base. And there are a whole bunch of very funky um, iconography and, and maps and screens and displays, which look a lot like they were made by Vasily Kandinsky. And so everybody has to go through these tests and they also find a teleporter pad, which teleports them to the planet and a whole bunch of barbaric aliens which try to kill them with spears and knives before they escape back to the space station using a bunch of boxes they find on the space station which act kind of like mental books you, you plug into them and you can get the knowledge off the big cubes they find out that the space station is in the solar system to protect the earth from a bunch of hostile aliens who find planets where intelligent life exists and take them over and and change the occupants of the planet so that they become brutish and aren't a threat technologically to this superior alien race. And so these very ordinary people have to man an alien space station and fight a space battle against an invading force in order to protect the Earth. Now, this is a big concept. This is something that you could do in a $200 million movie now. This didn't have a $200 million budget, it had a fairly small budget, and a lot of that was spent on sets and making a very funky looking robot, and also painting a lot of extras green so they could play hostile aliens. And so this is a movie where the script bites off more than the movie can chew. One of the tests involves a, a fake imaginary alien, which is there to test how the human beings react to aliens that don't look like them. And the alien that the machine projects as a kind of mental hallucination is ludicrous. It's the silliest alien costume. It's like somebody cosplaying an alien. And the other problem I've got is that the only print I could find of this movie, and the movie was filmed in a process called Eastman Colour, is a, quite a damaged print. All of the blue and yellow colours in the print were gone. So everything has a red and green tinge to it. And, and also the um, film stock has a lot of scratches on it. So it was a little bit of a battle to watch it. I don't know whether there's a better copy of it out there. But this is it's pretty damaged media. Now, the problem with the movies are manifold. First off, the actors aren't particularly engaging as actors. Apart from Patricia Hayes playing the tea lady and Charles Hawtrey. They both know the kind of cliched characters they're playing and they can do it quite well. And the Xena Marshall character, Sandy... None of them are particularly well-written, uh, and the whole idea, of course, isn't to give us well-written characters. It's to give us a movie full of space monsters and spaceships and alien technology. And it doesn't do it well. Now, I like some of the sets in this. I think there's some very imaginative set design in this movie. And it was made back-to-back -back with the second movie I'm going to talk about. And most of the budget went on this film rather than the second movie. It doesn't hold together at all. It's... The space battles, because of the incredibly limited budget, I think they spend most of the money on the sets, are really kind of low res. It was difficult to do that kind of thing well at the time because of technological limitations. And even if it was possible to do it well, you would have needed technicians along the lines of Jerry Anderson's people to make this alien spaceship work, to make the alien space station work and to make the invading alien fleet work. Missiles get launched out of the space station, you cut to the invading spa alien space force, and you see one of the spaceships blow up. It's at that level of things. 
you know, it's a fairly safe movie for kids to watch. I don't think it would have scared them even at the time. And yet it was a movie kind of geared to adults as well. So I'm not sure Amicus did too much marketing on who the potential audience would be. But it's kind of like science fiction fans and kids, basically. Nobody covers themselves in glory in this movie. Apart from the production design team who probably did a good job with fairly limited resources to give us a whole bunch of different chambers in this alien spaceship without spending terrible amounts of money. It's fairly obvious that a lot of the sets are, are quite cheaply made, but if you buy into the story, you buy into the shoddy sets. Um, I kind of liked it. I liked it more watching it this time than I had the two previous times I watched it. And I liked the escalation of the story. The, the core story has solid bones to it. Yeah, these guys are doing like a SETI project. They detect a signal. They send a reply. They contact the aliens who advise them of a large-scale interstellar war that they become a part of before, at the end of the war, they escape back to Earth. Good solid bones there. But I don't think there were the resources all the time, or the will, or the money, to make this story better than it was. Uh, it's at the level of a very cheap Japanese tokusatsu movie at the same time. But then that brings me to the second movie. By the way, the title, The Terranauts, is stupid. Both of these movies have stupid titles. Astronauts travel in space, therefore the Astro. Argonauts travel on the Argo. But what do Terranauts travel in? It, it's a very dumb name. Like the other movie I'm going to talk about, they came from beyond space. It's got a really good poster. The poster art is really great, but the movie doesn't live up to the poster art, as was the case in many, many movie productions in the UK and America in the 1960s. That then brings me to the other movie, They Came From Beyond Space. Another title that makes no sense, because how the can they come from beyond space? They came from space. Let's be honest, they came from space. They didn't come from beyond it. It's not like space is a public transport zone in a city. There's nothing beyond space. Again, this was made in Eastman colour, but the print seems to be a bit better on this one than the print I was able to get for the Terranauts. Terranauts was directed by a guy called Montgomery Tully, who'd been directing for a very long time. This one was directed by Freddie Francis, who'd worked with Hammer before. And the budget on this one was lower than it was for the Terranauts because it was intended to be a double feature with They Came From Beyond Space, which indeed it was. This one's based on a novel by a guy called Joseph Millard called The Gods Hate Kansas, which is a good title. I like it better than I like They Came From Beyond Space. And it's kind of a mashup between Quatermass 2 and Invasion of the Body Snatchers and something somebody thought of while they were drunk. You get you some sets from uh, Dalek Invasion Earth 2150 AD, which were left over as a cox cutting measure, a V-shaped formation of meteorites crashing Cornwall, and the scientific team is dispatched to investigate this very unusual phenomenon. Now, Curtis Temple, one of the head scientists, can't go down there because, because he's been in a car crash and had a silver plate embedded in his head, obviously because he, his skull was fractured. So he has to stay behind. Meanwhile, the team that goes down to Cornwall, they hit one of the meteorites with a rock hammer, and suddenly they're taken over by an alien intelligence cold and unsympathetic. Now, the people who get taken over grab some of the meteorite stones and exponentially start taking over everybody in the area. They take over the local banker so that they can get funding and start to build what it turns out to be a rocket base with the intention of sending rockets to the moon for reasons that become apparent by the end of the movie and don't make a lot of sense. Eventually, of course, the people in London figure out something's gone wrong and Curtis Temple goes down there and decides he's going to investigate. He finds all of the people in the area have been taken over by this alien intelligence, including his girlfriend, Lee Mason, played by Jennifer Jane. By the way, Curtis Temple is played by expatriate American actor Robert Hutton, who got a career in the 1940s in Hollywood because he was the same type as Jimmy Stewart, and Jimmy Stewart went in the Air Force. And so Robert Hutton got what they call victory roles which are roles that were intended for another actor, but that other actor suddenly enlisted. He was kind of semi-popular in the 1940s, but his career diminished in the 50s, ended up in England doing this kind of role. Curtis has to 
figure out what's going on and figure out how to stop it. Fortunately, Curtis is an expert in unarmed combat. He recruits his friend Paj, who's also a scientist, played by Zia Moyhaden, a Pakistani English actor, who's quite fun in this one. He pl- plays a comic relief without playing a stupid person. He's a scientist and they have to get some kind of head covering for Farge, which is made out of silver. And Farge reluctantly gets all of his cricketing trophies to be melted down to make a a very weird looking kind of um, head covering, which will enable him not to be taken over by the aliens. It's trying to leave her and get through to you. It can't get through. They also find out that ultraviolet light deprograms people from the alien influence and they get to leave back and they fight a battle and infiltrate the rocket base and take the rocket to the moon to find out what's happening. This movie is stupid in several ways. Uh, apart from Farge, played by Zia Moheden, there aren't any real characters in this movie. He lifts the movie above what it should be. The location shooting is pretty good. Freddie Francis wasn't a bad director. But it's obviously shot a lot closer to London than Cornwall. Because none of the scenery looks like anything I ever saw in Cornwall. Now, the alien base is created. isn't bad. It has a more metallic look than the one in the Terranauts. But that's because it was leftover sets from the Dalek movie. And ultimately they get to the moon where they meet the Master of the Moon. Played by Michael Goff in very pasty face makeup, and the plot then resolves itself quite quickly. Now, if I was going to pick a first and a second among this double feature, I'd reluctantly go for the Terranauts first because it's got the comic relief characters of Patricia Hayes' character and the Charles Hawtrey character. It's got a through line of plot that makes a little more sense and doesn't come out of left field the way that a lot of the plot for They Came From Beyond Space does. Even though it's a worse print when I was watching it, I found it more entertaining and more engaging, and I like the production design a lot more. What these movies tell me is this. There was a market for science fiction movies in the 1960s, both in the US and in England, and probably Australia, but they weren't being serviced very well until 1968 in Kubrick's movie, which I don't like, but a lot of people do. Science fiction wasn't given a lot of love and and wasn't taken seriously. And it's kind of nice that writers like John Brunner got a gig writing a script for a movie that was going to turn out to be trash. I think there was just such a pool of talent in the UK at the time among science fiction writers that if some big studio wanted to make a decent science fiction movie, they could have. I mean, even Kubrick got Arthur C. Clarke on board for, for his movie. But that should have happened earlier in the decade. I think that there was a lot of money spent by particularly American studios on trying to retrofit ideas for 1940s and 1950s movies. Things like Hello Dolly and Finian's Rainbow and even Dr. Doolittle. They were trying to keep musicals going well after the tide of musicals had passed. And they spent egregious amounts of money doing that. There was a missed opportunity in the 60s to kickstart the science fiction cinematic revolution a lot earlier than it did. And these movies are those little thin shoots of sprouting from the seed that are trying to punch their way through concrete. The takeaway for me in this is these movies existed, these movies were made because there was an audience for them. However, there were a couple of barriers. First off, the studios didn't know how to do science fiction well, didn't even like science fiction. And secondly, movie critics, apart from the obvious ones within the science fiction community didn't like science fiction either so the gatekeepers both at the production level and at the review level really disliked science fiction so there was never any traction for a science fiction movie in the early and mid 1960s in any meaningful way they were always seen as second rate entertainments and so the scripts weren't fantastic Europe did it a bit differently they did things like Alpha Bill and they did Fahrenheit 451, which is not a great adaptation of Bradbury, but it's a lot better than anything coming out of the UK at the time. And even though there were a couple of dystopian movies like Peter Watkins' Privilege coming out, science fiction as a kind of technological fiction and storytelling really wasn't given any love in the 1960s in the UK. 
But it was fun watching these movies. I don't know that I need to watch them again. They tried to do what they could with what they had. And I'll give them some credit for that. I think that they're honest, if really cack headed efforts. And they've got to be acknowledged as part of the history of science fiction. So anyway, that's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and leave a comment and hit the notification bell so you know when I talk about more things. You can also support the channel by donating at patreon.com slash terrytalksmovies. I intend in the next month or two to do a few videos that are going to be Patreon only. I've got a few ideas that probably won't fly that well with YouTube. And so I can put them at the Patreon level so that I can talk about things a little more freely than I can for a monetized YouTube video. Uh, so next time around, I'm not sure what I've got. I've got a couple of things that are arriving next week, which are going to be fun to unbox. A couple of new releases from Umbrella that I want to talk about. But anyway, in the meantime, look after yourself. Stay safe. The bug is still out there. Watch some good movies. Watch some bad movies. Watch some old science fiction movies with an awareness of how bad they are, but with some appreciation of the fact that they got made at all. And I'll catch you next time.